Dr. Joe Cushardi will talk about N95 surgical mask papers and scarves. Dr. Cushardi is a is a uh, expert in this area. He is a certified industrial hygienist, a certified safety professional, and is a, regi a registered sanitarian, registered environmental health specialist. He is the founding principal of Kuchari and Associates Inc. I've known Dr. Kuchari for over 15 years, and he's an, an excellent uh, colleague, very knowledgeable, and a great speaker. He's also a member of ACNT, and it's a pleasure to have him today with us. Today's topic. Today's topic uh, is certainly a very fluid situation. The things that have worked in the past are not common practices today. Uh, we get, certainly get routine calls every day about N95 respirators. Can we reuse them? Can we not reuse them? What type of respirators are better than N95s? We have PAPRs. Do they work well? So I'm going to try and jump right in here and address all of those situations right now. Uh, I will mention that, uh, again, common practice from the past is not what we have today, and we do have to rely on both our knowledge, our senses, and our common sense as we know some of the facts and, and information about the equipment we'll be talking about here today. Next slide, please. So proper use of protective equipment is both critical and essential not just for our healthcare workers, for anyone who may have some exposures. Uh, left circle, you'll see we talk about uh, N95 respirators. And again, many of the questions that I get routinely are, are respirators protective? Uh, keep in mind that N95 respirator is designed to eliminate 95% of airborne particles. And uh, it has a protection factor, something that we'll talk about a little bit later on of uh, 10 to 1 or another 10% of particles that can penetrate around the seal of the mask. So while an N95 respirator is good protection, it does seal, it does create a barrier, there are pieces of information that we should be aware of when we are using the equipment. Even if protective equipment is used properly, we certainly need to think about what we're touching, how we're removing it, how we're decontaminate, decontaminating it, and in today's environment, whether we're going to think about reusing it again. Uh, respirator is only as good as the seal around it itself. <clears throat> we get a lot of questions today about surgical masks, face masks, face coverings, uh, other types of devices that are put over one's breathing zone. And keep in mind, none of those have seals on them. So if you believe that a respirator is only good as a, as a tight-fitting seal, and the FIT test proved that we certainly need to have some caution when we use some other devices that may not have a tight seal as well, too. Next slide, please. We hear words like OSHA, CDC, NIOSH, FDA. Keep in mind, OSHA develops the rules for how we use respirators safely. CDC talks about the recommendations, when we should or shouldn't use respirators. NIOSH and uh, one of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and FDA talk are the certifiers. They tell us what is a respirator, what is a surgical mask, and that they've passed certain tests. Next, please. As we jump into respirators, I certainly want to mention that things like the hierarchy of controls, staying away, administering and engineering hazards away, things like the six-foot rule that we see all the time today are the most effective means of preventing exposures and preventing hazards. I, I start out with this slide. At the end of the presentation in 10 minutes, I'm going to put up a slide that says, what about when all of our respirators run out? Or what about tomorrow if there are no respirators? And I think I could put this slide up at the end as well, too, because then we're back to engineering controls, elimination of hazards and administrative controls versus relying on the equipment that we have. So it's very important to remember that if we can stay away, if we can administratively control our hazards, we don't have to rely on the protective equipment that we're going to talk about here. Next slide, please. 
the hazard assessments that have been put out by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in particular NIOSH, talk about what's appropriate for our situation today. They talk about preferred PPE use. They talk about acceptable hazards. At this point, let's all agree that having some sort of a barrier to prevent exposure to mucous membranes from splashes, from airborne particulate, from droplets, is something that needs to be there. Let's all talk about something like a face mask or a respirator so that we protect our, our breathing zones. And let's all agree that probably the most contaminated part of our body are the things that we might touch, so we certainly need at least a pair of clean gloves and a gown to stop those splashes as well, too. I see that you'll see that the preferred means of respiratory protection is actually a respirator, an N95 or higher, and I'll talk about some other types of respirators in a second, but an N95 or higher respirator. I'm cognizant that today alternative respirators like face masks or surgical masks or FDA-approved masks are out there, but let's keep in mind and use our common sense about the times that we need to use those or not use those or prioritize both types of use. Next slide, please. When we talk about body protection, when we talk about gloves, and I realize that's not the primary focus of what we'll talk about today. We'll be primarily talking about respiratory protection, but keep in mind we have options there as well, too. We can select various types of body protection, gloves, gowns, uh, Tyvek suits, but they all need to work for us. People ask me, should there be a certain specification, a certain standard, or a certain type we use? You'll notice that on this slide, and I think the slides are going to be available to folks, there are different tests for fluid resistancy. There are performance tests, the uh, ASTM tests. There are liquid barrier tests as well, too. And those liquid barrier tests are the important ones. The ANSI PB70 test is a test that's done either with water or synthetic blood, and it identifies the protective barriers, the ability of that particular gown or suit to stop liquid penetrations uh, from a level one up to a level four, with the level four being the highest. Level one, two, and three protection, ANSI protection, are garments that have passed tests based upon liquid penetration. The level four garments are those that have passed the synthetic blood penetration tests as well, too. The ASTM standards, the performance standards, will all reference the liquid barrier performance test. What's the short story? If you're looking for a good protective barrier, a suit, a gown, you'll certainly want to make sure that it's been performance tested first that someone has tested it, and then secondarily, the optimal ones are the ANSI PB70 level three and four tests for liquid performance. Next slide, please. In addition to body protection, we'll briefly talk about face and eye protection. Remember, face and eye protection are protecting our mucous membranes, but we're basically stopping splashes and splatters. Face shields are good protection. Obviously, they cover the face, the nose, the mouth. Uh, some of them are disposable. Some of them are reusable. I know in the current world today that some disposable equipment has been, that there are procedures to reclean them with the standard EPA list and certification uh, fee for substances or with standard bloodborne pathogens cleaning agents, and they have to be reused. Uh, obviously, in the continuum of best decisions, if we could use throwaway equipment all the time, we could. If we can't, there are processes and procedures that I am aware are being used on that equipment. Um, so that they can be reused, in particular, over a, a shorter period of time. I will mention this now, probably from my observations in the field. The most common mistake I've seen in decontaminating equipment over the last two months has been 
the lack of time between uses, the lack of time, the lack of residence time for sprayed on cleaning agents and sprayed on sanitizing agents, the attempts to reuse equipment very, very quickly. So if you do have a process or a procedure for reusing, um, whether it's disposable or ordinary equipment, please do make sure you follow your process. You have a process that allows for residence time of the material on the surface of, your, of what's being cleaned. Surgical masks, FDA masks uh, are also splash protection. While they're not considered respirators because they don't have a tight seal, uh, they do prevent fluid contact. They do cover the nose and the mouth. They do prevent our breathing zone from vacuuming uh, materials in, so they certainly do provide some protection. Finally, I'll mention that when face shields are not available, Goggles are our next best option. Goggles are many times reusable. Goggles can certainly be uh, sanitized. The goggles eye protection is generally classified in three ways, safety glasses, uh, vented goggles, and non-vented goggles. Obviously, the best ones would be the, the non-vented goggles. Safety glasses themselves may not prevent splashes, and indirectly vented goggles are good as well, too, because they don't allow much of the material to splash into our faces and into our mucous membranes, and they also allow for a defogging of materials a little bit easier inside the goggles. Goggles can be re reused. Next, please. Air purifying respirators. The N95 respirator. Um, take a look at what you see here. It's a respirator. This particular N95 respirator has a valve in it. It allows a little bit easier breathing. That gets to be important at times when you're using these for extended periods of time, times in hours versus minutes. There are Identifiers on it as well, too. There are locations that identify it as an N95 respirator somewhere on the face of the respirator. They identify it as NIOSH approved, the group that does certify respirators versus FDA, who certifies uh, surgical masks and barrier protection. So uh, this, is the, this is the N95 respirator that we see most used in healthcare facilities now. Next, please. In addition to N95 respirators that are common, on the left side of the slide, you'll see that there are other types of tight-fitting respirators. They are a little bit more difficult to use. We'll talk about cartridges. We'll talk about cleaning. We'll talk about weight in a second. But tight-fitting respirators, equipment that provides a seal when it is used appropriately, when it is used with the right cartridge, when it is sanitized and cleaned, and when fit testing is performed, does provide good tight fits for uh, our face and our breathing zone. You can see in the other, slide, the other picture that if an N95 respirator is used, you certainly want to have mucous membrane protection, eye protection. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll notice a powered air purifying respirator. Some of those are loose-fitting respirators. Some are tight. I'll note that loose-fitting respirators only work in the positive pressure mode, or you don't have a seal, and that powered air purifying respirators, while they do provide a little more protection, next slide, please, do have their concerns as well. They're battery operated. They are a little bit more difficult to sanitize and clean. Obviously, they need cartridges and filters in them, but they do provide a positive pressure. They do provide an airflow over the breathing zone in the face piece, so they are much more comfortable to use over a longer period of time. Again, on the disadvantaged side, uh, they're more cumbersome and expensive. Battery charging is required. There is a slight noise with them, and they'll work for our current situation if the filters are appropriate and the filter changeout schedule is used. I ran into a situation in the last couple of weeks where powered air purifiers were being used, and the safety officer assumed 
that because the intake for the papper was on the rear side of the individual, as you see in this picture, or up on top of the mask, that filters were not needed. A big mistake, pappers cannot be used without filters. Uh, whether we can get the filters or not, power air purifying respirators need to be used with the appropriate filters. Next slide, please. I'll just mention rapidly that air purifying respirator filters, sometimes called cartridges, come in a variety of sizes, colors, uh, identifiers. They're all certified for a specific type of respirator. One cartridge does not fit all. One cartridge does not protect against all. Brands are not interchangeable, and change-out schedules are needed. In our current situation, the concern that many safety and industrial hygiene officers have is how they'll be cleaned for the reuse that's needed. Obviously, filters that are on the front uh, of, a, of an individual could have splashes and contamination as well. And obviously, there's some closure over the filter that's needed to keep it both structurally sound and non-contaminated when it's not in use. So while I'll mention that there are a variety of filters and cartridges here, um, I'll also again reiterate that it's not the easiest thing. It's difficult to ensure you have sufficient filters for your pappers and that cleaning during uh, the downtimes between you reuse happen acceptably. Next slide, please. Let's take a look again back at our, our N95 masks. I think if you looked at the N95 mask up in the left-hand corner, you'd see some of the identifiers that come on them. Uh, most notably that it is an N95 mask. It's a filtering face piece. It's a dust mask. It's a face tight-fitting uh, uh, tight fitting respirator. In our situation, it's one of the better, if not uh, some of the best pieces of equipment that we can get because of the size of particulates that it can filter out because of its weight, and because um, in many cases it's disposable. We'll talk about limited use and reuse about of 95 again in a minute. I would suggest that you do take a quick look at the right-hand picture for a second. You can see the individual has face protection on. You can see that there is some sort of gown or, or suit protection. You can see that gloves are in place, and you can see that the N95 respirator is in place. Next slide, please. Again, a quick shot, a slide that shows you on an N95 respirator that there are a variety of pieces of information that you can acquire from the respirator itself, not the least of which is that it is an N95. Again, I'll mention that this particular one has an exhalation valve on it that reduces the physiological burden, if you do breathe in it continuously, if you are in it for hours versus, versus minutes, makes it a little bit easier to work. However, not all N95 respirators have exhalation valves. Next slide, please. I many times get the question, what is N, what is R, what does P, what do the numbers stand for that go with all of our filtering face pieces? And while I alluded to other types of respirators in the first five minutes of our presentation here. I do want to center in on our NR&P 95, 99, and 100 series respirators because for medical procedures, I think these are the ones that you will come across most commonly and we could spend other times, we could spend more time on PAPRs and full face piece respirators and things like that as well too. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think these are the ones that you should be aware of. The N in N95, identifies it as not resistant to oil. All N-series respirators are originally designed to be throwaway respirators, single-use respirators. The R in the respirator identifiers, if you have an R95 respirator, identifies it as resistant to oil, 
They were originally designed to work for an eight-hour shift. The P, or oil-proof respirators, were originally designed to work for up to 30 days. If you take a look at the right-hand side of the slide, you can take a look at the filter efficiency. N95, 95% efficient. N99, 99% efficient. N100, uh, equivalent to a HEPA filter, or 99.97% efficient. And you can do the, the wire chart to connect these however you'd like. In industry and in healthcare, for the most part, up to this point, we've seen N95 respirators used almost exclusively, not completely, but almost exclusively because of their, uh, their cost. They were the cheapest ones to purchase uh, and still meet all of the standards that are here. I'll summarize it one more time. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see N, not oil resistant, single use, R, oil resistance, one day use, P, oil proof, 30 day use based upon the expected degradation of the filters, and then on the right hand side, the filter efficiency. We are in a situation where we're not, we do not have standard use all the time. However, I think we can all, if we have the options, think through what the identifiers mean so that we can make intelligent choices out in the field. Next, please. Let's talk about surgical masks for a minute, FDA masks for a minute. Um, they're basically a face shield over the responder. Remember, they don't have a tight-fitting seal. Remember that they are designed for single uses. But also recall that as a loose-fitting shield, they certainly do offer some protection from material that may be splashed, especially during aerosol generating procedures, material that could be splashed or otherwise thrown up in our, our breathing zone into our, respira uh, our respiratory system. The most common question I've seen over the last week or two relative to surgical masks is, should I wear a surgical mask over an N95 respirator? Will it extend the use of the N95 respirator? And is it designed to be used that way? While it is a face shield, the answer to that is no, it's not designed to be used that way. It does prov uh, provide some, uh, an additional physiological burden on the person who's using it because then you're breathing through two devices versus one. However, it does provide some additional protection, in particular in the area of splashes, as it is uh, an engineering control. It is a face shield over the lower part of your face. Um, as we move forward, I think we need to be aware of how long we may be using these items. Um, Remember, these are single-use items, both FDA face shields, FDA surgical masks, as well as N95 respirators. If we are going to use, reuse N95 respirators, one of the guidances we'll talk about in about five minutes is to inspect them prior to reuse so that there is no obvious contamination on them, blood, uh, dirt, grime, aerosolized products. And um, while it's not an approved procedure, if you do have a face shield or a surgical mask over it, you are preventing that from happening. Keep in mind, if you do that, uh, we have a lot of medical professionals in, on the call today. You're all medical professionals. You do know that you have an additional physiological burden, and you're going to start to see some difficulty in uh, breathing in that way. Next, please. Let's talk about protection factors for a second. When we do fit testing, we can assign a protection factor or how well that particular respirator fits the individual in place. In the old days, individualized uh, protection factors were issued, but now we can issue protection factors based upon the simple fit testing that we do, and I'll talk about fit testing in a minute. A half face piece respirator, a filtering face piece, 
Anything that has a seal around it that seals tightly to your face, we'll talk about not having hair growth in a minute as well too, but those respirators will have a protection factor of one for every, uh, excuse me, of 10. For every 10 particles, for every 10 droplets, for every 10 items that are outside, one will get through based upon the standard test procedures. As we go to higher levels of respirators, how are your purifying respirators, full face piece respirators, and then in, in um, fixed locations, supplied air respirators or self-contained breathing apparatus, you see that the protection factor is much higher. So keep in mind, even with an appropriately fitted N95 respirator, we have a a protection factor of 10, so some materials are getting through to our breathing zone. Protection factors identify the ability of the mask itself and the seal of the mask itself around your face piece, around your face when a, a appropriate fit test has been performed to keep materials out of your breathing zone. Next slide, please. Remember, prior to using a respirator, the employer must do three things for the employee. Number one is ensure that the individual is medically cleared. While that's not required for voluntary use, uh, I believe we'll be using it in mandatory situations in all of our medical applications. And uh, the medical clearance, a simple OSHA questionnaire that's reviewed prior to training and fit testing is an essential part of the respiratory protection program and respirator use. Over the last two months, I can count on, I, on more than one hand, probably I don't have enough hands and toes, hands and feet, fingers and toes to count the amount of times that I've been viewing respirator use and I've seen individuals pull respirators off inappropriately because they're claustrophobic, because they don't have a good fit, because they're not comfortable in it, because uh, of some sort of a physical deformity that doesn't fit right. It's been a couple of times, folks. So let's make sure that we pick the ability of an individual up, both medically and physically, prior to putting them into any type of a respirator. Number two, we do annual training. Annual training to those of us in the industrial hygiene world means two things. It means before an individual has, the, has used a respirator in a hazardous situation, number one, he or she has put it on in a safe situation, and number two, he or she has put it on in a simulated hazardous situation. Those two components of training, in addition to the who, what, when, where, why, how we do it, how we maintain it, and those two things are essential, in particular in our current emergent times, to use a respirator appropriately. When people ask me, can you cut to the chase, Joe, tell us what respirator training is good or bad, I, I identify that if you haven't given an individual to try it on twice, you're probably not doing effective respirator training. Let an individual try a respirator on, in a safe situation, let them put it on a simulated use situation as you go through the, the decon training or the end of work shift training, and at that point they should be able to use it appropriately. Third component of any respirator program is an annual fit test. There are qualitative fit tests, it's fitting or it's not, there are quantitative fit tests that are used for higher protection factors and other types of respirators, uh, the ones we see right now are qualitative fit tests. Because any respirator that you'll use in the current situation needs to seal tightly against the individual's face, a fit test is essential. Qualitative fit tests can be done on two or three people at a time if you have the materials. Qualitative fit tests take about 10 minutes or so to perform, to do them appropriately. Again, in addition to the medical clearance, the try the respirator on twice, the training component of it, how you maintain it, the fit tests are essential to ensure that we have a tight seal and that we're 
adequately protecting our breathing zone. There is a current OSHA exemption for fit testing. That current OSHA exemption says that if you've been fit tested more than a year ago on the same size, style, brand, and you don't have any other major physical changes, then there's no need to do an annual fit test. Um, that does not apply to other trades other than the healthcare workers right now, but it is out there now so that it's, uh, if you're working in the current COVID situation and you've had a fit test at your facility, at your hospital, in your public health arena for the appropriate respirators, you need not repeat it annually. Next slide, please. People have also mentioned to me can we do homemade fit tests? Can we mix up vanilla oil? Can we mix up banana oil as we used to do in the old days in the industrial hygiene world? Can we throw baby powder at a mask and see if it gets through? And obviously the answer to all those are no. Um, and some of the other international standards, fit testing is not required. So if there is, uh, uh, if, you, if for some reason we get into an emergent situation and fit testing is not possible, while it is still required under the rules and the regulations, uh, a homemade fit test doesn't do anything other than no fit test at all. Remember, every time you're using your respirator, you want to do a seal check. The seal is the important part of the respirator. Make sure that there's no facial hair growth between the respirator and uh, the ceiling area of an individual's face. In my testing, and I've been doing fit testing for 30 years, probably longer than some of the current standards are out there, the worst time for facial hair is uh, right about 24 hours when individual's facial hair starts to stand up. Uh, people have said to me that I can get appropriate fit tests with full beards. Sometimes they do, they, sometimes they don't. To keep in mind, facial hair growth changes all the time. Like a physics equation, that affects the seal of your face, so people need to be clean shaven. Next slide, please. We're in a situation where we may not be able to get NIOSH-approved, American-approved traditional respirators. I will identify that there are other standards that are out there. You can see the, comp uh, the countries or the jurisdictions on the left-hand side of the chart that you're reviewing right now that do have other performance standards and classify respirators in other ways. Um, you can also, I'll also mention that the one that I have seen most often quoted now and sometimes used right now is the European EN149 standards. Um, they qualify respirators as uh, filtering face piece level one, two, and three. A level two face piece under the European standards is 94% efficient. Uh, keep in mind our N95s are 95% efficient, a similar standard. An FP3 face piece under the European standards are 99% efficient, uh, similar to our HEPA filtered respirators as well. People have also asked me about KN95 respirators, um, respirators that originally were not approved because of some testing differences but are now approved as equal to N95 respirators. Those are the Chinese respirators that are, fit test, uh, that are uh, tested under those standards. A KN95 respirator. Very similar to a 95, uh, an N95 respirator. So keep those in mind as well too. Next slide, please. Optimization strategies. NIOSH, FDA, some of the professional organizations have put out optimization strategies and when and how you should use respirators in, I guess, what we call desperate situations. They're not available. Obviously, the best respirator to use is a current regular use respirator 
that has been fit tested or with the fit test suspended um, right now is used as it should be, a traditional respirator. The second best option is then to use uh, expired respirators. Some manufacturers, although not all, have identified an expiration date for their respirators. I am aware that some of the regulatory agencies have tested about a dozen or so models and brands of expired respirators and have found most, not all, but most to be acceptable. We suggest doing a good check of an expired respirator, in particular, the headbands and the straps, the elastometric parts that tend to dry out if you are going to use expired respirators. By the way, training, fit testing, um, observations with respirators are excellent uses. If you're using an expired respirator and it does give you uh, some face seal, that's probably better than a surgical mask. Third best option is the use of respirators approved under other standards. We don't have to go back. Uh, we don't have to go back so that uh, we see the previous chart, although when the slides are distributed, you will see that the previous chart had respirators approved in other countries. Finally, limit, uh, or fourth, limited reuse of N95 respirators using them for more than a single use. Keep in mind the concern there is have they been visibly contaminated and how are we storing them between use? Next, use of expired respirators from other countries. And then finally, some sort of community face covering as we've seen advertised over the last two weeks or so too. I would suggest that you could use this hierarchy if traditional respirator use is not available to you at the time. Simplistically, use a respirator, next best, use an expired respirator, next best, use something from another country. And I kind of uh, interchange those two. I think they're both number two options. Third, limited reuse of N95 respirators that have been in certain uh, hazardous situations. Finally, extended use and then community face coverings if you need to use them. Next, please. What do we do when no respirators are available? What do we do when we don't have anything left? I'll mention that and that's a very difficult situation, but now we're back to the first slide that I put up here again. Uh, we're back to administrative controls. We're back to engineering controls. So we're kind of back where we started. Administrative controls exclude those at most risk, potentially use those with immunities in some situations, use ventilation. Um, and I think utilizing ventilation appropriately, I, I have seen that used a few times very recently by placing large fans behind areas, by, by placing HVAC systems on 100% outside air exchange, by increasing the outside air exchange ratio and ventilation systems. All of those will reduce the viral load, the, the droplet load in the breathing zone, so all of those certainly will give some help to individuals if no respirators are left. Last slide, please, or next slide, please. I think most folks have probably seen our Surgeon General's How to Make Your Own Face Covering uh, video or YouTube where he describes how to do this over the weekend. Keep in mind, if you are using some sort of face covering, you're protecting someone else. You're not necessarily protecting yourself because there is no good seal uh, around your face. It's, uh, it's not a replacement for social distancing situations. It's not a replacement for anything else. But I will mention, in closing, what I call the Jenny Cachardi Project. Jenny's my daughter, and about 15 years ago, she, she was at a science fair project, and she needed Dad to help out with, some, with a science fair project. So we developed a test based on fit testing procedures 
or common items that you found around the home. T-shirts, jackets, towels, things of that nature. And without going into too much detail, I can tell you that each one of those did provide some protection when we tested them with challenge agents under the OSHA fit test procedure. So I will close out by saying make your own face mask, protects others. It's not a replacement for social distancing, but by the way, it may provide some protection to you as well too. What my daughter did find in, the, in that particular project was that if you could see through the, rest, the, the face coverings that you had, it probably didn't work well. And the more layers or the more difficult it was to see through it, the little bit of protection that it added there. This is not an endorsement for face coverings as respirators. Remember, it's how you make your own face covering to protect others or what to do if we do not have respirators available. I'll close now. Uh, my email address is on the last slide. You certainly can. I'll be on the, the, the webinar. I will put myself on mute for a couple of minutes, but if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them uh, today if we can, too. Thank you very much. Dr. Hossein Hassanian Mugaddam. Uh, he's actually a fellow of the American College of Medical Psychology and presenting on behalf of the Asia Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology. Dr. Hassanian is a clinical toxicologist at the Shahid Behshati University of Medical Sciences in Iran, Iran. Please, uh, Dr. Hassanian, go ahead. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for introduction. Okay. And from, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to present our toxicological public health concern during uh, COVID-19 in Iran. First, uh, let me describe COVID here. Uh, most of the deaths due to coronavirus infection in the Middle East has been registered in Iran. Just today, officials reported that uh, 67,286 people had been infected with COVID-19, of whom almost uh, 4,000 uh, died due to virus. At first glance, nobody could believe that this epidemic could be followed by another outbreak. Uh, when first the first of COVID-19 in Iran emerged on February 20, uh, 23rd, many people felt that a smart way to delay and prevent the spread of viruses was by storing more disinfectants at home at, and at the workplace. Alarm over COVID-19 has caused a run on masks, gloves, disinfectants, and hand uh, sanitizer, as well as large black market now demanding record prices for these items amid a general shortage. Despite alcohol production uh, or consumption being prohibited in Iran as a Muslim country, a false rumor also circulated in the media claiming that drinking alcohol could protect people from COVID-19 infection by washing the gastrointestinal tract and the lungs. The ensuing high demand for ethanol led bootleggers to decolorate industrial alcohol containing pyridine. pyridine as used to avoid human consumption, as it is a bitter uh, material. Using bleach and to sell these as supposed ethanol. Uh, please please uh, play the video. We are going to show a video uh, that Dr. Yeah, Hassan yeah. provided. Dr. Hassan, can you please comment on the video? What, what is showing? Yeah. Sure. I believe this video is showing an industrial alcohol to which exactly. the illicit manufacturer is adding bleach to, the, to change its color to a clear liquid. 
and sell it in the illicit manner. Thanks for explanation, Ziad. Uh, so you, you, you cannot show the uh, video completely, yeah? Okay. Anyway, today, Iranian Legal Medicine Organization announced that during current outbreak, 728 people have died from methanol poisoning and hundreds have been hospitalized after consuming toxic alcohol. This is why the number of death cases in hospitals reported by Ministry of Health was almost 400 cases, meaning that many people died out of the hospitals, probably due to fear of being infected by COVID-19. Up to now, 3,640 cases were hospitalized in Iran during to methanol poisoning. Unfortunately, 1,000 liters of bootleg alcohol discovered by police forces that were ready for illegal distribution, mostly containing methanol. So probably these alcohols are shipped to industry. So we analyzed hand sanitizers of the market and found that 17 out of 30 samples have methanol inside, which makes it much less effective as an as uh, uh, disinfectant. Let's show the picture. Two slides down, please. One more slide. One more. Yes. Yeah. yeah. As you can see here, this is a sample of the uh, hand sanitizer that uh, are uh, selling in the community. And uh, because many people are interested to buy these materials nowadays, uh, actually, uh, all of them are fake. Uh, interestingly, the death toll due to methanol poisoning has surpassed COVID-19 deaths in some provinces, especially in southern parts, parts, parts of Iran. Although the outbreak is ongoing, our data shows most people drank alcohol to get high as they had available what was supposed to be ethanol and enough time spending at home to be isolated, maybe without fear of punishment in a messy situation. A minority, however, use alcohol to wash their gastrointestinal tract in an effort to treat or prevent the coronavirus infection, which means uh, show the CT image. Previous slide, please. Yes. Thank you. As you can see, in situation of one of my patients, you can see patchy ground glass opacities in left upper lobes of lung. It is very interesting. It is, a, it is one of the methanol poison cases that's supposed to use the, uh, uh, actually alcohol to wash his gastrointestinal tract. Anyway, it seems that we should predict different toxicities and get ready for them while we are dealing with COVID-19 and other coming epidemics. Thank you very much for your listening to my presentation. And if you have any questions, let's do my best to answer. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Yan. I appreciate you staying up late in Tehran and uh, sharing with us uh, at least one therapy that is not proven to work for COVID-19, which is methanol, based on your CT scan there. Uh, our, our, uh, good luck with the outbreak. And uh, thank you again for raising awareness about this public health problem uh, with the rest of your colleagues around the world. Uh, please stick around for any questions that come through on this chat. Uh, we'll hope to finish by 4.30 p.m. Thank you for sticking around, everybody. Um, last but not least is an update from New Orleans. Uh, Dr. Lisa Moreno is the president-elect of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, which is one of our partner organizations. She's a professor of emergency medicine, director of research, director of diversity, section of emergency medicine at Louisiana State University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Lisa Moreno, please go ahead. Okay, um, can, can you hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. Okay, great. So I just wanna tell Dr. Hossein that if alcohol were the cure for uh, COVID or prevention, we wouldn't have it in New Orleans. But uh, we have 16,284 cases reported 
since our first case was identified on the 10th of March. So that's a pretty steep curve. We've had 582 deaths reported to date and quite uh, despicable statistics. 70.48% of those are black, 28.61% are white, and the statewide population of African Americans is only 31.5%. And New Orleans population of African Americans is 60%. So you are seeing that it is more than the disparity is more than double. Um, our death case rate is 41 per 100,000, which is the highest in the nation. So our death case rate is outstripping New York. And we've had the sharpest rise anywhere nationwide in cases. 97% of our patients have comorbidities. 25% of them have uh, coronary disease. 25% of them have chronic kidney disease. Almost half have diabetes. Almost two thirds have hypertension. 25% obesity and 10% cancer. Currently we have 1,996 patients in the hospital as of today and 519 of those are on ventilators. The state has completed 4,609 tests and commercial labs in Louisiana have completed 70,046 tests. And so you see there's clearly a panic because if this many tests, um, 75,000 tests were done, but only 16,284 are positive. So people are, are frightened and are rushing to be tested. Our resources, we do have vents that are not in use. There are about 100 ventilators currently not in use in our state, and we have created ICUs at multiple sites, and currently we have 158 ICU beds not occupied as of today. The Morial Convention Center opened at 7 o'clock on Monday morning to accept non-vented patients and nursing home patients who are positive and need to be isolated. We still do have empty beds there. Um, we don't know how quickly they will be uh, filling because we look like our curve is starting to bend. Although we don't want to announce this publicly because we have had a lot of challenges with getting people to socially isolate and we are afraid that if we announce this publicly that we are going to have a second surge of cases because patients will stop socially isolating. Another concern of ours is that ED volume is down, although this is happening internationally, we have seen that, and acuity is up. But we are concerned about conditions that are being neglected by patients who are fearful of coming to the ED while COVID patients are there. We have noticed that our dying at home rate has increased significantly. We have between eight and 10 calls from EMS per day of patients dying at home. Our other concerns are obviously PPE. We have been told that we are gonna be cut off from the federal stockpile supplies. This is a rumor. We don't have any definite information on this, but for us, this is a real concern. The clinical characteristics of our patients we are seeing more than the usual number of COVID patients presenting with diarrhea. And our patient population is coming back with a high rate of acute kidney injury when we diagnose them uh, with suspected or as a rule out COVID case. We're also seeing elevated D-dimers, many of whom are actually presenting with PEs and DDTs at the time that they come in as a suspected COVID rule out. We're also seeing, seeing elevated troponins frequently in our patients, and we don't know if this is due to the high rate of underlying cardiac disease in Louisiana, or this is just due to COVID in our patients. And like everyone else, we're seeing a lot of leukopenia. Our approach to treatment, um, we, we know, of course, that this is a disease without a cure or a treatment, and so our focus has been on evidence-based treatment of symptoms specifically pneumonia, hypoxic respiratory failure, acute kidney failure, delirium, and septic shock. Our goals are to decrease ventilator use, to decrease ventilator time, and to decrease ICU days. We are proning patients on high flow oxygen, and we are broadly using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. 
When we do have to vent a patient, we are ensuring that tidal volume is accurate for 6 cc per kilogram of corrected body weight, because we do have 25% of our patients who are obese. And on patients not in septic shock, we are doing conservative fluid management and even using diuresis on some of them. We are using PEEP, although this is very controversial, and I know that in New York they're recommending against it. However, we are finding that our extubation rate is higher than the national average. We're waking people early, we're extubating people to BiPAP or six liters nasal cannula high flow O2. And as I said, we have a higher extubation rate than the national average. We are using Zithromax for admitted patients and occasionally for sent home pneumonias. And we are doing a prospective randomized control trial on hydroxychloroquine using placebo as controlled, and we're closely following QTs. We are considering studies on hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis, as well as hyperbaric oxygen therapy on moderately ill patients who are not yet ready to be intubated. And both of those protocols are into our IRB for approval. So that's the report from New Orleans. All right. Well, thank you all for those fantastic presentations. We've received lots of questions, and I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. Again, my name is Mark Kostick. I'm the president of the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology, and I'm thrilled to be here with our partners of ACMT and our uh, tox fellow uh, partners from around the world uh, to uh, bring this content to you. So a lot of our questions were, uh, will be directed towards Dr. Cochiardi. Uh, and lots of questions about PPE, and specifically the masks, uh, how long we can keep using the masks and how we can clean the masks. So uh, the first question we'll ask, how about uh, disinfecting the N95s with UV light or heat? Any good science to that? Any suggestions? Dr. Cochiardi. <laughs> How long any of the sanitization procedures will work for? So I, the, there are standard procedures out there. Battelle has a system. There are glutaraldehyde systems, hydrogen peroxide systems. There are a variety of things that we probably don't have access to. So I think when we get to the level of surgical masks, face masks, and things like that, we need to fall back on the best available option. Um, the jury remains out on whether surgical masks can be washed routinely in hot water. Remember, hot water recommendations for things like washing machines are up above 120 and 130 degrees and then hot drying. And you do need that temperature to start to, um, to kill the virus that we're talking about here. So, while I don't have a specific recommendation for how to, use, how to clean what were supposedly non-reusable face pieces, I can tell you that if you can sterilize, sterilize them, that's better than washing them. So if you're in a facility that has some sterilization capabilities, uh, that's better than washing them. I can also tell you that if your last resort is to wash them, the hotter the water and the hotter the dryer you can get, the better. Obviously, in each case, you need to inspect them to maintain, make sure they maintain the integrity. I am familiar with a facility that has tried washing N90, um, and both N95s and surgical masks, and in some cases, they only got two or three uses out of them until they just uh, you could see through them and they would fall apart. So we don't have the best answer for that. If I come up with something better as the research continues and the papers come out, I'll certainly get it to uh, the society to pass around. In between patients or even for repeat use over several days, um, what's your opinion regarding that? So extending the use of an N95 respirator is not a bad thing to do. Many, in the old days, we would go from um, swab A to swab B to swab C, from bed A to bed B to bed C, and we would change, we would dispose of the respirator every time, and we would change protective equipment each time. 
extending that process for as long in the day as possible is up there in the hierarchy of strategies. So if you can keep the same respirator on, and really what I'm saying is keep the same seal around your respiratory system for an hour or two or three versus, you know, minutes time, then that's a good strategy to be able to do it that way. Not as acceptable of a strategy is to take them off and put them on each time, obviously, because then you're touching the outside. You may be touching your face in different locations with uh, the straps and things of that nature. So if you do take it off, then you're going to want to do some sort of, uh, of an inspection and cleaning process if you can, uh, or at least non-use of the same respirator again for a period of time. Uh, one final question uh, regarding the masks. The, uh, is there, are there any data regarding the ability of the N95 to filter out uh, the virus, which might be as small as 50 microns, uh, when the mask would only go down to, what is it, 300? Uh, do you have any so, concerns regarding that? So that's an excellent question. And I think uh, the viral particles are down below one micron or below one-tenth of a, of a micron. HEPA filters will filter down to about three-tenths of a micron. But what the research has shown is that although there are pore sizes of that level, it's almost like, I'm showing my age here, an old pinball machine in the old days to try and get that viral particle through. So using a high-efficiency filtered respirator works better than an N95 respirator, and that works better than, a, I'm sorry, an N99 respirator, and that works better than an N95 respirator. But there is some data and there are some journal articles about um, the efficiency of the, the smaller size poor respirators relative to the, even though the size of the virus is a little bit, a little bit smaller than that, basically showing that they do work. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hassanian, we, a few questions regarding uh, any of the mitigation strategies that the Iranian government has instigated in order to prevent COVID or methanol poisoning. Has there been any kind of concerted effort by the government to mitigate this problem? Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I'm not involved in uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, I'm involved in methanol cases. Uh, but by the way, uh, educational programs by uh, media uh, uh, to avert people that uh, these alcohols are not drinkable and they may uh, affect your body and kill the people and even uh, make blindness for many people. Because when we are talking about uh, different outbreaks, we usually refer to the mortality, not to the morbidity of the uh, the effect. Actually, uh, uh, many people nowadays are blind because of the methanol poisoning, and uh, this, uh, this may uh, uh, be very bad uh, for the future of the uh, public health system, because most of them are young and uh, uh, should be uh, supported by the other people. So, this is a bad story nowadays, and uh, we hope that this uh, experience uh, led us to uh, go further for future plans in order, uh, actually, for, uh, like the, uh, many other Islamic countries, we, we should have a plan for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, for Dr. Moreno, a couple of questions. Firstly, uh, it's interesting that you're doing a study on hyperbaric oxygen uh, when the, the pathophysiology of the respiratory uh, oxygenation issues is more consistent with high altitude pulmonary edema than it is with ARDS, it's seeming. So what are your indications in the study you're putting into your IRB for hyperbaric oxygen? Yeah. 
adopt hospital standards on the verge of um, being intubated. So right now what we're using as our triggers for intubation is 80% uh, saturation on um, six liters of high flow oxygen. So when we're getting close to that number, we're gonna be randomizing people either to standard of care or to uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And our, our philosophy is exactly, or our underlying um, idea comes from exactly what you said, that to not just us, but to people that we've spoken to in China, Italy, and other places around the country, a lot of critical care folks are saying this looks like hate. This does not look like a typical ARDS that we normally see from pneumonia and septic shock. And do you have any thoughts on empiric anticoagulation uh, based on the evidence that there seems to be microemboli in a lot of these folks? Yeah, so I'm not sure that the data is, yes, we're seeing a lot of microemboli in a lot of these folks, but in some of the sicker patients, some centers are reporting um, that they're going into DIC. So we have not designed a study to look at um, the use of anticoagulation, we just don't feel that we have enough evidence to hypothesize that that would be the correct way to go. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cochiardi, back to you. Um, is it necessary to refit uh, a refit test in N95 when you're switching manufacturers? It is. Uh, refit testing is required for different sizes, different styles, different brands. So a 3M medium is not the same as a uh, Hillary medium or an AO medium. Uh, refit testing is required. Okay. And another question is, some places are recommending wearing a mask under a papper. Now, to me, that makes no sense at all, but uh, what would you uh, have to say about that? Wearing like a surgical mask or even an N95 underneath a papper. Any evidence that that is something good to do? It seems to me like to be counterintuitive. So I, I agree with your, your thought process there. However, I have seen that out in the field, in particular in uh, some of the EMS transport worlds where um, I guess folks are trying to be as protective as possible. My feel on that is that number one, it's, while it's not, a, it's not an approved procedure, but it also only adds to the stress, the physiological stress that the PAPR is trying to take away by having the positive pressure. Uh, so you've got a positive and a negative pressure working at the same time. Um, so it's gonna give you more stress than it is protection and I'm not sure that it increases the protection factor of the PAPR. I'm guessing this next question might be a it depends answer. Uh, but the, the question reads, as an anesthesia provider, should I be gown and gloving, N95, boot covers, eye protection, et cetera, for all patients during intubation, regardless of their COVID status? So I'm assuming that has to do with the prevalence in your community, but what are your thoughts? So, Personal protective equipment, exactly as described, is designed for any sort of uh, disease that may be circulating in the communities or in the location, whether you're servicing prisons, whether you're servicing uh, healthcare facilities or whatever. So those are always good procedures to use if you may be in that path of any sort of aerosolization. Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, another one reads, what if we are looking at a limited supply of surgical masks in our long-term care setting? What's the best way to optimize our supply? So, a good question. Again, uh, we'd hope we weren't in that situation, but if we are in a situation where you're trying to optimize the supply, let's take these one at a time. You're, you're going to need some face shields. You're going to need some respiratory protection, and then you're going to need gloves and a gown or something as you approach your, your, your patient, the aerosolizing procedures and things that we just talked about. So first, if this is a long-term nursing facility and you're able to schedule, administer, 
put up barriers, you know, a piece of plexiglass or anything like that so that you can engineer the hazard away, that's going to be your, your, your first option. Resanitizing, routine cleaning, um, placing areas under a negative pressure or a positive pressure that vents directly to the outside is certainly going to be useful there. Remember, we can push air 17 times easier than we can pull air. So positive pressure works, good, works very, very well from, a, from an engineering standpoint. So all those things consider first. Number two, we know we're going to get into some sort of problems with protective equipment. I would consider sanitizing face shields. I've seen that work not optimally, but well out in the field. I would consider inspecting gowns or suits, not reusing them if they're stained, potentially reusing them uh, after they've been away from, uh, from the individual if they are not stained. And then finally, we're back to the question on reusing respirators again. And if you have to get to that level, the strategy is um, inspect them, extend the use, inspect them if you have to, and then uh, finally, if there is some sort of sanitization or cleaning procedure, hot is better than cold. You know, warm is better than, than cold. Hot is better than warm um, if you have to do that. But I'm not sure that that's going to work if you do have the stained materials that are there. All right, I'll try to squeeze in a couple more here. Um, regarding the paper bag, uh, harp, uh, for the N95s, if COVID can remain active on cardboard, are these paper bags potentially harving COVID bacteria or virus, or are they and allowing for its growth? So I'm not an expert in disease growth. However, I can tell you that the theory behind plastic bags versus paper bags is this. Before you use the respirator, the N95, the first time, you should always have it in a plastic bag to keep it uh, sanitized. After you use it, the theory is put it in a paper bag to keep it clean because it's already had some exposure. So what you're trying to do is keep any of the stains and the, and the, the blood products, the body products, the dirt, the grime, and things like that off of it. All right. Um, finally, here's a here's a real loaded question for you. I think this will be our last question. If a facility is not able to provide appropriate PPE for its healthcare workers, should they refuse to work if they're taking care of potentially COVID infected patients? So, wow, a loaded question. But let me try to address that. Um, I think one of the first things that I mentioned in my presentation is that we are, we are in times when standard protocol may not work. So we have to use our ability to think through situations and to understand the science of the equipment that we're using and as well as possible the situations that we are putting ourselves in. Typically, typically it's never acceptable to risk your life if the procedure that you're following is not saving someone else's life. So consider that first. Consider the job that you're doing. Consider the equipment that you have. And if it's something that may not be a life saving or a life uh, safety action, you may want to consider not doing it because if, if the potential risk to you as you've evaluated it puts you yourself in that life-saving position or life-threatening position. Um, so then the follow-up, the corollary to that is, is it acceptable to risk your own life to save someone else's life? And again, I caveat that by saying, I think we all on the call know when there's times when we need not be in areas or we need not, we're, we're basically not performing life-saving activities. However, if you get into that situation, I think that's a risk assessment that you have to make on your own uh, based upon the two, the, the two sides of the scale. 
how much risk are you willing to accept? And number two, what's the chance of that risk actually making a difference from a life safety standpoint? That sounds like a wordy answer, and it is. It's a question that I can't give you a yes or no to. Um, I like the first part of it. Don't risk your life if you're not saving somebody else's life. Uh, the second part gets to be a little bit more difficult. Over. Fantastic. Well, I apologize that we weren't able to make it to, uh, through all of the questions, but I think our time is up, and I'm going to send it back to Dr. Kazi right now. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. I just remind people that this is recorded and uh, will be available on Friday, the PDF and the slides as well. Dr. Wax would like to conclude. Uh, yes, hello, everyone. And I'd just like to uh, thank uh, the uh, faculty today for this excellent and very timely presentation and the moderators uh, for a well thought of uh, a Q&A session. I think the combination of presentations today uh, was very impactful and uh, it our mission, which is to you know, provide as much uh, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, communication to as many people uh, on a regular basis as we all fight through uh, this pandemic. Again, thanks to everyone attending today. We had uh, 2,500 people attend uh, for this important presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, reporting up on our website and uh, we'll uh, make announcements uh, no later than this coming Monday about uh, the program for next Wednesday's 3 p.m. Eastern uh, uh, Daylight Time presentation. Uh, thank you very much.